Okay, this video covers confidence intervals for proportions. So, by the end of this video, you will understand what I mean by confidence, and you will definitely understand what I mean by interval. All right, let's talk about what we just got done learning in our previous chapter over sampling distributions. Remember, the idea with the sampling distribution was, we said, hey, what do we expect our sample to look like? And we said we expect it to be the true value. And then we said, well, you know what, our sample might not necessarily be exactly true, it might deviate. So we have the sampling distribution sampling distribution deviation, which was the square root of PQ divided by M. Then we're able to draw this, <coughs> excuse me, able to draw this nice picture where we put the truth in the middle and we said, hey, some samples might be a little bit high, some samples might be a little bit low. This was a great chapter. I think everybody really enjoyed it. Pretty simple. Actually, nothing really too hard in there. But there's a problem. This whole idea right here all depends on the fact that I know the true value which is awesome, but what if we don't know the true proportion? Well, if we don't know the true proportion, we can't put it at the center of our model because we don't know it. We can't calculate standard deviation because we don't know the true P, nor would we know the true Q. So standard deviation's out, so we kind of run into a problem. So that's what we're going to cover today. How could we find an estimate for what that true value might be? And what we want to do by the end of today is learn how to build an interval. An interval is going to be a value from a low end to a high end. <coughs> and we want to be able to be fairly confident that the true value is somewhere in that interval from one number to another number. So by the end of this video, you're going to understand how to build that um, confidence interval. All right, so still might be a little bit confused right now. Let's explain with an example. Suppose we have an absolutely enormous, I'm talking a huge barrel full of beads. I'm talking beads for crafting, right? All different colors, all different types of beads. And I want to know what proportion of them are red. Well, the only way to know the true proportion would be for me to count every single bead, figure out how many of them are red, and do some division. That's going to take an awful long time. I don't have time for that. What I do have time for is to take a sample. So let's just say I take a sample of 175 beads, and of those 175, 28 are red. That is a proportion of 0.16. Now, that by no means <coughs> tells me that the exact value, or the exact proportion of red is 0.16, because I know that this number may vary. So, as I start to think through this problem, I have to think logically about what's happening. First off, this sample better be random. You can't do it unless it's a random sample, right? We talked about that already. You're going to have bias if it's not random, so I do need to make sure that's a random sample. Now, the next thing I have to understand is that if I would put those all those beads back and grab another sample after I mix up the jar, I might get a different proportion, right? I might grab another 175 beads, and I might not get 28. I might get more, I might get less. The whole idea is that samples are going to vary. So I need to try to understand that variation. Well, we understand standard deviation pretty well in this class, I think. So let's take the square root of 0.16 times 0.84, all divided by 175. And using our calculator, this ends up being 0.0277. All fine and dandy, right? Well, let's first off understand that if I'm going to calculate standard deviation, I need my samples to be independent, which means I need my sample size to be less than 10% of the population. Okay, that's nothing new. We've heard that before. But wait a minute. If you're truly listening, there's a major problem right now. The formula up here for standard deviation is the square root of the true P times the true Q divided by N. Well, wait a minute we don't know what the true value is. So I use my formula kind of haphazardly. This is not the true P. This is a P hat. 0.84 is not the true Q. That's a Q hat. So this technically isn't standard deviation, which brings me to this. Standard error. When the standard deviation of a statistic is estimated from data, sorry for the typo, the result is called the standard error of the statistic. So basically, when you don't have the true P, all you have is your P hat, you can't call it standard deviation. You have to call it standard error. Think of standard error as the next best thing to standard deviation. So here's what we have. We have the standard error 
of our sample statistics, so the standard error of our proportion, of our sample value, is the square root of p hat q hat divided by n. The good news is it's the exact same formula that we just got done using, but because we have to use p hat and q hat, we can't officially call it a standard deviation. It acts, it behaves exactly like a standard deviation, but it's not. It's really, really close. It's called standard error. The reason is, is it wasn't based on the true p nor the true q. So come back over here. I have to call this standard error. It's like, like I said, the next best thing. Okay. <coughs> So I get that, this is what my sample showed. But not every sample is going to come like that. And by no means is that the true value. Here's my standard deviation. The last thing I want to think about is the normal model, right? Hold on a second. To use the normal model, to think about the big normal model, I do need to have a big enough condition checked. I do need to have more than 10 successes and more than 10 failures. Well, this is awesome because I know I have 28 successes. That's more than 10. And it's pretty clear I have more than enough failures, but I'll do it real quick. 175 minus 28 is 147 non-red or failures. So I definitely got the big enough condition satisfied. So what I want to think here is how big do I want to make my interval, right? Because when I start my interval, I'm going to start at 0.16. That's what my sample showed. That was my p hat. And I want to go up a little bit, and I want to go down a little bit to create an interval for where I think the true value will occur. However, how much am I willing to go up? How much am I willing to go down? <coughs> I don't know. Well, that's where the level of confidence comes in. So how much you're willing to give each way depends on your level of confidence. This is how much I want to add, how much I want to subtract from my value in the middle, the p hat, to determine how confident I am. So we have several different levels of confidence. I kind of wrote down some common ones here. <coughs> The most common one is 95%. How do I figure out what that means? Well, I'm talking about the middle 95% of data. Now, for a long time now, we've been saying that from negative 2 to positive 2 standard deviations, right? From negative 2 to positive 2 z-score, we have 95% of our data. Well, that's actually not exactly true. It's pretty close, but not exactly true. How can I figure out the exact value? Well, here's the process I have to walk through. I'm going to think about a normal model, right? And as long as I met those three conditions, I can think about this normal model. And I want to think about the middle 95%. So if I want to understand the middle 95%, I need to understand what's left out. Now, if I'm talking about the middle 95%, that means that 5% is left out. Now, that 5% gets split evenly because of symmetry, 2.5% on the bottom, 2.5% on the top. Now, why is this important to me? Because in order to find the z-scores that represent the middle 95%, I need to use the bottom tail. That's just how invert norm works. So I'm going to go ahead and grab invert norm of 0.025. I'm looking at the bottom 2.5%. And as you see, I get a z-score really, really close to negative 2, but not exact. It's actually negative 1.96. So from a z-score of negative 1.96, and because of symmetry, I know that the top 2.5% would be positive 1.96. That would be the z-score that would represent the middle 95% of data. If you really want me to prove this to you, you can now go and grab normal CDF and go from negative 1.96 to positive 1.96, and you would get pretty much 95% of data in between. So, how does this negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 tie in? Well, it comes back up to here, right? I'm willing to give, in order to be 95% confident that the answer is going to be in my interval, I'm willing to give 1.96 standard deviations either way. Right? So I'm willing to give 1.96 standard, wait a minute, mm, hold on a second. Mm, they're not really called standard deviations, they're called standard errors. So I'm willing to give 1.96 standard errors either way. So that would be positive. This over here would be the negative 1.96 standard errors. So <coughs> it comes down to our understanding that what we're pretty confident that 95% of data is in between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 standard errors of that p hat, right? So I'm going to create an interval that starts at 
0.16 and I'm going to go up and I'm going to go down to kind of build this interval for where the true value might occur. So when I go and grab my calculator here, I'm going to do 1.96 times 0 0.0277, okay? And that's where I get 0.0543. Now that's actually called my margin of error. That's how much I'm willing to be off, right? I understand that by no means is 0.16 the exact value, okay? It's just a sample value. But if I go up and down about 1.96 standard errors, I'm pretty confident that the true value should be somewhere in that interval. And this value, the 1.96 times that 0 0.0277, is what we call our margin of error, 0.0543. So this value is going to be my plus and my minus 0 0.0543. So I'm going to move this over here just because I'm running out of room. Basically, if I take 0 0.16 and go down 0 0.0543, I get a low end of my interval to be 0.1. 057. If I do 0.16 and go up 0 0.0543, I get the top end of my interval to be 0 0.2143. So at the end of the problem, I still don't know what the exact answer is, but I'm 95% confident that the true proportion of red beads is somewhere between 10.57% and 21.43%. Okay? Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Well, again, that was based on 95% confidence. We could also lower our confidence. Lowering our confidence is going to widen our interval, right? Lower confidence will result in a wider interval because I'm not so confident that it's going to be in that interval. Okay? So, let's see here. If I'm 90% confident, then that means 10% is left out. Okay, so let me think about this normal model here, 90% in between. 90% in between, 10% left out, that 10% gets split evenly, 5% on the top, 5% on the bottom. So let me grab my calculator here, and I'm going to do an invert norm of the bottom. Why am I doing the bottom? That's just how invert norm works. Invert norm only works with that bottom um, tail, that bottom probability of 0.05. So I get a z-score of negative 1.64. So this z-score right here would be negative 1.64. This z-score up here would be positive 1.64. So between 1.64 and negative 1.64 is 90% of my data. So for this particular problem, I'm willing to give 1.64 standard error each direction. Now that's smaller, so I actually want to correct myself for a second. If I want to be less confident, that's going to be a more narrow interval. It's going to be a smaller interval. Again, why is it smaller? I said that wrong a second ago. I'm sorry. It makes sense. Smaller interval. I'm not as confident, right? I'm not as confident that the answer is going to be in that interval, so it's a smaller interval, okay? If I want to be 99% confident, that means only 1% is left out. So let's draw that real quick. So I'm really, really confident, right? 99% confident. Now, if I'm really, really confident, that's going to create a bigger interval. Bigger interval, I'm more confident that my answer's in that interval. So let's see here. This means that 0.5% is on the bottom tail. 0.5% is on the upper tail because 1% is left out. So when I go and grab invert norm, I have to make sure to do 0 0.005. And that confuses some kids, so make sure you understand the 0.005 is for the 0.5%. And I get negative 2.58. So negative, negative, sorry. I don't know what's going on. Here we go. Negative 2.58 to positive 2.58. So again, if I want to be 99% confident, I'm willing to go 2.58 standard deviations into each direction. All right, so to kind of summarize all of this, I have a nice formula here to represent how to find a confidence interval for proportions. You start with your sample proportion p hat, and then you're going to go up and you're going to go down your margin of error. The margin of error is calculated by taking a z star times your standard error. Z star is based upon how confident you want to be. Again, how confident you want to be depends upon your level of confidence. So Z star will change depending on your level of confidence. The most common one is 95%. 95% confidence means I'm willing to give 1.96 standard errors.